Thank you so much, Alex. Um, welcome everybody to join our panels, the seven panels of the day actually, for this particular uh, international conference organized by Chulalongkorn Universities um, based in Bangkok, Thailand. My name is Banubhatra Khan Chitian. I'm the director of the Master of Arts and Doctoral Programs in International Development Studies, Faculty of Political Science, Chulalongkorn Universities. For these panels, we're gonna be rethinking about international development and the future of developments under the theme of two words, co-creations of knowledge and futures for global commons. In these particular panels, we try to explore the future of international developments. In the past several, in the past two years, we've seen how COVID-19 pandemic has shaped and changed the global political landscapes. Social, socioeconomic situations and cultural landscapes are also affected and being um, altered because of, of, as a result of, of the pandemic. We have seen the rise of violence, conflicts, and it's ongoing, as you can, may know, in Ukraine at the moment and in some other corners of the world as well. We've seen political polarizations, social divisions, and also economic stagnations in every corner of the world. The shortage of vaccinations and healthcare access in many places, especially in the global south, also reflect the development gap and the deepening global inequalities that we are facing in through knowledge exchange today, hopefully from um, the scholar of the East and of the West, and also from practitioners. We hope to be able to rethink the international development in years to come in terms of its landscapes, emerging issues, and at the same time approach, and also the meaning of international development. Um, for the sessions today, we will try to explore um, the set of the following, the following sets of questions. Number one, how will, how will international development landscape be in the post COVID-19 era? The question number two, what would be the emerging issues in international developments in years to come? The third one, what are new approaches to the studies or the understanding of international development? And eventually, when we talk about international developments, what will be its meaning? Not only in the post COVID-19 context, but in the context of whatever happens around the globe right now. For our panels today, we're gonna have three distinguished panelists to join us. First, we have Professor Dr. Jin Sato from the Institute of Advanced Studies on Asia, University of Tokyo, and also President of Japan Societies for International Development. Second, we have Associate Professors Dr. Mandy Sedan, Director of the Graduate Taught Programs in Global Sustainable Development, University of Warwick, who joins us from the UK. And last but not least, we have Mr. Hermes Fong, Design Thinking Practitioners and the co-founder of InsightPack, which is organization set organizing this particular event as well. Um, just roughly on the agendas and the format for these particular panel discussions, it is planned to be interactive and more conversational. After the opening remarks that I will give all the welcome remarks, we're gonna start the panel discussions with um, the speakers, which is Mandy Sedan, um, who's gonna discuss international developments from the perspective of the global North and the Western countries. And at the same time to look more and, and explore more how things gonna be like um, for roughly around 15 minutes to 20 minutes. And after uh, Mandy's give a presentation, then each of the speakers here gonna be able to intervene and raise some issues if it's burning or urgent that you want to respond to some of the points right away. Following Mandy's, we're gonna have Professor Jin Sato who gonna give a perspective of what's going on on the Eastern part of the world and also from the perspective potentially from, from, um, from Asian side. And then we have a, a practitioner's insights from Hermes to actually jump in. By at the end of the, the first hour, hopefully we're gonna have some five to 10 minutes dialogues among all the three participants. And then we will yield the floor to all the, um, those of you who are listening both in Zoom and also um, on Facebook Live. All right, without any further ado, I would like to start our panel discussions by introducing the first speakers for today, Professor Mandy Sedan. As I mentioned, Mandy is currently director of the graduate thought programs in Global Sustainable Development, University of Warwick, um, School of Cross Faculty Studies. Prior to that, she was a senior research fellow and affiliated with St. Anthony's College, um, the University of Oxford. Mandy has published a lot in a wide range of issues related to international development with a particular focus on Myanmar particularly in, in the areas of the Kachin states in the north of the countries. The research of Mandy's was also published by Oxford University Press and the British Academies in 2013 as Being and Becoming Kachin, History Beyond the States in the Border Worlds of Myanmar. And the book was also awarded the inaugural Euro-C Nikkei Asian Review Prize for Best Book 
in Humanities in 2015. Without any further ado, may I invite Mandy to give us the floor, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Khan. And can I just say um, thank you so much for inviting me to join everybody today. It's a real pleasure. And I have to say that I've, I've rather selfishly agreed to be involved because I think I'm going to learn more, more than I'm going to be able to offer. So um, I know that you want to develop a conversation. So I'm going to throw out some, some general comments and um, then we can hopefully have as much conversation during the session as possible because it's obviously such a critical time for everybody at the moment, thinking about you know how we all interact and learn from each other. And that's clearly the, the key purpose of this panel overall. So um, it, it's quite difficult to kind of pull apart all of the different elements of, of um, the questions that we've been asked to address. So I'll just very briefly make a couple of comments around the idea of development and its relationship to international development. And then really critique this idea of the global north and the global, global south and whether this is still really the, the paradigm that we, we should be using. Um, and then of course, we've got the impact of the pandemic and what we see now unfolding in Ukraine. So some comments related to that. And then perhaps raise one particular issue, which um, again, rather selfishly, I'm going to raise it because it's something that I've been very engaged with at the moment, which is around rare earths and the uh, rare earth elements and uh, the role that various critical minerals, which are globally distributed, um, but the, the way they get implicated in technologies for energy transition and the discourses around that, I think they, are, they offer a really important way of us to, to think through some of these issues and where we're moving on from previous understandings of development to what we need to think about in the future. So just a few comments about those. Um, so in terms of the idea of, the, of development, I mean, obviously this was very much used as almost as a proxy for international development for a while. And it, it kind of seems increasingly inappropriate in some ways to use either term to try and encompass all of the, the actors and processes and all of the major challenges with which the, the, the world as a whole engages in, in, in these current times. Um, and I think, you know, we are really past that point where big D development, um, which is driven by countries from the north and sec from the north into the south, is considered the most crucial in shaping development outcomes. So, you know, we're, we're definitely moving into a different um, need of you know how we how we approach these issues but at the same with with little d processes of development as well so ongoing economic transformations which have to involve civil society and private sector as well as states um, you know these have long been argued to be the essence of development and underdevelopment and shape helping to shape really uneven processes of uh, progress and well-being for example um, so you know where where do all of these different dynamics come together now, obviously, the, the, the UN has tried to promote the Sustainable Development Goals as, as being a response to that. Um, but, you know, it's very contested, obviously, and who's who's driving the agenda. So although we know that these things are not working in the, in the sense that they truly re represent everybody's interests and that they reduce inequalities, um, the, the, the way that we're starting to critique this obviously means that, um, you know, we, we know that we've got to move into different ways of thinking and being and, and conversations with each other. But that's a very idealized vision as well. I mean, you, so if we think about what's going on in Ukraine, I mean, that depending what the outcomes are, um, you know, there's, there's a strong indication at the moment that this will very quickly um, surpassed the COVID-19 pandemic as the main issue that's going to drive ideas of development in the global north, at least. And I think also that the Ukraine crisis rate, you know, really shows up what is the global north. There are mo multiple global norths and it doesn't actually make sense as a binary anymore because the global north doesn't really exist in the sense that it was assumed to exist um, previously and I think that's what um, you know the, the, the unfolding tragedy in Ukraine is really bringing home to us. Um, but let's go back to COVID-19 because obviously that this conference was framed against that before we had these, these terrible recent events and I think that the COVID-19 pandemic has done something very dramatic to us globally in terms of how we see our interactions and certainly from the perspective of people in Europe, in the UK, where I'm from. I mean, that, and it's, it's not clear yet how it's going to unfold though, because we're, we're involved in our own culture wars. We're involved in our own disputes with internally around what development means. There's no consensus 
Yeah, we, we haven't got a consensus, I think. Um, so on the one hand, I think there is very much a, a, an increased sense of global interconnectedness. And we've seen how quickly this spread everywhere and everybody was affected. And, you know, there is, I think, a strong sense of we are all, all involved in this. And that makes you rethink how, how integrated we all are. You can't escape it. That's a reality when you look at um, the COVID-19 pandemic. But then the other reality is that you have these, these huge inequalities that exist. So um, it, it, it's not so much only an issue of um, the governments that can afford to buy vaccines and then retaining them for their own uses. It's, it's also about the technical and knowledge infrastructure, which enables some countries actually to develop the vac vaccines themselves. Um, so, you know, you have to take a step behind that. And then um, that becomes a very complex relationship between the technical knowledge production and then the governmental decisions about how you distribute it. Um, so, you know, this is again where the tensions with the, the political framing and political ideologies of development also have a, have a big impact. Um, so I think it's really un unclear now, especially in the context of the Ukraine crisis, just exactly what the outcome of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic will be um, on how um, country, high, high income, um, high, high economic uh, status uh, countries view development going forward and their responsibilities within that. Um, because I, I think one of the things you can see already emerging within Europe is that there's been a focus on um, uh, the, the, the vulnerabilities of gas supplies. So, you know, one issue that's likely to come from, from what's going on currently in Ukraine is that there may well be a push now um, for the energy transition and developing technologies for, for carbon zero. And that can be framed as something that's globally responsible um, because, you know, it, it, we have the climate crisis and therefore we should push towards um, large scale offshore wind farms or e-mobility and all of those high, techno high technologies to achieve that. Um, and so it's seen as a, as a global good, a protection of the global commons, but actually a lot of the geopolitical agenda underpinning it. Um, it's also very much embedded and it's going to be driven by, by events in, in Ukraine. So um, the rhetoric and the reality, I mean, it's probably a hybrid set of interests, to be honest. Um, but again, it, it's not clear, but I, I think that it's clearly going to have an impact in trying to push forward those technologies. And so this is where my interest in rare earths comes in, because um, I don't know how familiar you will be with this, but um, I'm sure that many of you will be aware that rare earth elements are absolutely critical for high technology uh, developments for energy transition using, if, if we want to use high technology to, um, to, to, to address this issue. So the creation of permanent magnets, I mean, it's, it's dependent upon having access to rare earth elements. So a lot of rare earth elements, obviously the, the market is, is dominated by China, but a lot of those rare earth elements are also mined in incredibly marginalized places. Um, so that's where my own interest in it comes in because I, I work in the, the northern parts of Myanmar. And um, there's been estimates that you know, 74 to 94% of all China's uh, rare earth imports come from that region. It's all entirely un um, unregulated. So you have this situation where you've got one of these incredibly marginalized places in, in not just in Asia, but globally, you know, that there's the, the very limited access to um, electricity, very limited access to um, uh, just basic household amenities. But the, the environment there is being used to anybody who's got a, a smartphone, you're also implicit in this. We are also implicit in this. And so this is, again, where these binaries, these geographical binaries start to collapse a little bit. So I think this is going to be perhaps the biggest challenge in, in how we think about development as, as we move into a, a really challenging new era post COVID and also who knows what the, what the global um, implications of, of recent events will be. Um, but on some level, we all have to recognize how we are um, involved in the, um, the creation of problems 
And then where, where do we allow the people who are actually supporting some of the solutions? And we, we tend to focus on supporting high, high technology infrastructure, but actually it's those, those small communities on the borderlands with China and Myanmar that are vital to, supply, to supplying some of the materials that are supporting the, the technologies that we need for the energy transition. So it's kind of connecting all of those things together to see then how global inequalities look and how people can, um, how, how we collectively feel that we have to share the benefits and the challenges of this and, and understand the trade-offs. I think that's going to be one of the, the biggest challenges in uh, development as we go forward. And obviously we'll be talking more about what this term development means during the panel. So Khan, I think that's kind of what I would like to say just to kick things off. All right, thank you so much, Mandy. Before we move on to some other panelists, I mean, Kent or Hermes, you anything that you want to, to jump in right now to respond to what Mandy has been mentioning for the time being? Otherwise, I have some points that I would like to raise also. Hermes, yes, please go ahead. No, I just wanted to hop in here to just, just, just kickstart the conversation too and just say that I resonate with so much of what you said, Mandy. I, I love that you are bringing up the topics of a big D development on a little d development and how that also uh, contrasts just with all these paradigms that we're working with that we learn when we're in studying international development and how and how it, it brings to mind like how do we prepare students to hold all of these things when they actually go into practice and because it's such an uncertain constantly changing moment <laughs> that's all that's all I'll say for now I'm just really excited to go into conversation all right, thank you, Ernest. I mean, let me follow up on, on what Mandy is mentioning for a little bit. I mean, one thing that you mentioned that I think is quite interesting is that now we are moving beyond the war of the binaries, right? And then you also mentioned about the multiple global nodes that we are facing. Can you elaborate more on that idea a little bit on what do you see would be, if it's not a, a binaries, right? And in the world moving forward in terms of development, how would it be? Is, is it going to be multiple global, local, or even global or whatever? I mean, can you, can you comment on that a little bit more, Mandy? I wish I had an answer, a clear answer to that, Khan, to be honest. So, I mean, just some, some thoughts about the pressure, because you asked me to speak from the perspective of the global north. And so my, my immediate response is, well, I don't know that I know what that is. Um, you know, I know what it is in the UK, but then the UK is kind of trying to go on its own path with creating a division with you know where we were in some ways where we were situated for the last few decades and it, I mean it, it's really confusing um, but I think from you know from the perspective of being in in the UK <clears throat> there's also loads of other pressures that have come in to make us rethink who we are um, so you know the 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 when you look at young people in schools today, I mean, the, the mobilization they have around climate change, but also the, the Black Lives Matter movement had a massive impact for many people in terms of how they, how they see their, their place in the world, because you can't understand that without getting a, a bigger sense of global interactions and also global problems and responsibilities. Um, so, I th and also, you know, the Me Too movement. I mean, these things have been very, very important, but the, the problem is they've also created their own culture wars. We're not debating them as, as important issues that need to be um, understood and incorporated into how we move forward. They're, they've become zones of contest. So I think, you know, in terms of what what the global north looks like i think I, I i would hate for it to be just a polarization but there's art there's clearly a dynamic which is producing that um but i think you know i actually have a lot of faith in young people who have have grown up knowing something very different if you've grown up with the internet and you don't know what the pre-internet world looks like it's very difficult for you to imagine you know how, how would you even do research before google um, you know, it's, it's a completely different world. And so this is where there is a huge generational gap, I think. Um, and, and I think that young people really, really see themselves more globally. Um, and that even when you have spaces within the, the, the global north, which are very, very multiply disadvantaged, um, there's, st there's still a connection that people can have and it's different to in the past. So uh, it's not really answering your question, but I think it's just lots and lots of problems which are just playing out and all of these crises are bringing them forward. 
Certainly. I mean, before we move on to Jen for a bit, I, I just have one more point that I want to I want I want to, to ask for your clarifications also. Early on in your remarks, you also mentioned that you know Ukraine, the, the war in Ukraine right, right now will be one of the most important issues that's going to be shaping the ideas of international development, particularly in the global north, even more than COVID-19 that happened, you know, like um for two years of now in June the the third year already, right? Can you elaborate on that more? It's that I, it's a tied in directly to the issues of the, the energy transitions that you're trying to get at, but with, with your emphasis just now also, or what are some other emerging issues within the global north that could be um, expanded more, furthermore, you know, like based on, on, on how the war is going to shape you know, the whole um, development complex? I, I don't really feel um, capable to answer that in detail again, Khan, because I, you know, I don't really, I'm only getting what I see on the media. I, I have no knowledge about this as well. But one thing I do know is that for the last week, we've gone from a, a period where we were having daily COVID updates, daily COVID figures. It was just an obsessive um, kind of dialogue around COVID. I haven't heard anything about that. Also within, within the last week, there was this very, um, very important announcement that was made, which said that the that some of the changes that are being caused by climate change are now irreversible. That that was just buried in in um, you know very deep within the, the the media. That should have been so important, but it just didn't come come forward. So how how is it being discussed? I mean, it's being discussed with with huge anger and you know with the human rights issues and um, you know that there's this genuine genuine sense of outrage. And, and support for people. Um, but there is also this issue of lots of discussion around the price of gas. And you know that later in the year, households are going to see their, their gas prices rising to you know, 3,000 pounds a year and that people just actually can't afford it. There's also already a lot of people in, in fuel poverty. Um, so th there was already a gender before about um, you know, trying to move towards, well, obviously supporting the, the move towards carbon zero, but trying to encourage e-mobility, phasing out petrol cars and so on. So I mean, th this is where I think this is just one thing where things will, will come together because it's something that also plays out with publics that maybe don't understand the geopolitics, but they understand their household amenities and the costs of those. Um, but what the rhetoric will be around it, I, I, I think is, is too early to say. All right, thank you so much. I think one of the important points here that you point out, and I think it's quite important, is that the role of media is also seems to, to, to be something that also shaped the narratives of how development is going to be pursued or done in the long run, and you know, like the, the, the perspective of the of the public as well, right? At the same time, so this going to be one of the issues that perhaps we can pick up later on in our discussion as well. Um, perhaps you know, like from the perspective of the practitioners, like for example, Hermes, that you can you know share some more insights into that as well. Um, so thank you so much, Mandy. I will come back to you again later on. So now let's move on to our second speaker for this panel. We have Professor Dr. Jin Sato together with us. Professor Sato is a professor in the Department of um, in, in, of, in the Institute for Advanced Studies on Asia, University of Tokyo, and also the President of Japan Societies for International Development. Um, he previously held a visiting professorship at the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs and was affiliated with the Agarian Studies Program at Yale as well. Professor Sato also won the Jap Japan Academy Award, um, the Academy Medals in the field of humanities and social sciences for the year of 2013. So without any further ado, I will yield the floor to Professor Sato now, and then you also have around 15 to 20 minutes, and then we come back right. to yeah. around discussions. So, go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Khan, for your kind introduction. Um, my name is Jean Sato. I'm a professor at the University of Tokyo. Um, it's really my pleasure to participate in an event organized by Chula and, and particularly by the Department of Political Science because it's the Library of Political Science uh, Department is one of the, my, my favorite place that I visited during my graduate school years. Um, I wrote a dissertation on the politics of forestry in Thailand. So back in the, uh, in the mid 1990s, uh, I had a lot of opportunity to use uh, the resources of, of Chulalongkorn University. So, uh, but, but uh, because of COVID, I haven't had the chance to visit Thailand for the past three years or so. I'm kind of getting homesick. And I, I, um, I, I feel that participating in this, uh, this event is, is kind of like will help uh, heal my homesick a little bit. 
uh, by um, uh, you know uh, to, to to have this feeling of of getting engaged with my uh, Chula friends. Um, um, I I prepared my talk in response mainly to the four questions given by the organizers. And each question, you can almost write a book. It's, it's a huge, they're all a big question. Um, um, some of my responses are, are very short. Some of the, my responses uh, are, are medium. Um, but let me start by uh, first saying, uh, responding to the first question, which, which is how will the international development landscape be in the post COVID-19 pandemic era? Um, in my talk, I won't talk very much about COVID-19 in the hope that we don't have to talk about it uh, in, in the near future. Um, but I, I just want to focus on, on the idea of development and just to, and, and, and perhaps I will come back to Mandy on this because I do totally agree that development does not capture um, uh, what, what we are dealing with. And but but again, okay. What what are the alternative terms? What are the alternative concepts? So maybe this is something that we can talk about later. Um, okay. So um, the the landscape of international development. I, I have a um, um, very uh, a brief response to to this. More 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 precisely, what will affect this? Um, I think there's going to be a politics of truth. What, what is truth? Um, um, you know, as we all know, a lot of information is manipulated uh, uh, by media and, and sometimes scholars and politicians. And, and who, you know, the general public is wondering what exactly is the truth. Even, even um, in, in the COVID situation where the, the impact of, of the effect of the vaccine, um, you know, the, there are a lot of uh, disbeliefs or you know, mis mistrust about what the, ex the medical expert says in, in any country, um, um, especially perhaps uh, most strikingly in the US. Um, so more information does not necessarily bring us to the reality or the truth. And so who controls the power of who controls the media, who controls information? And how does um, uh, literacy bring us to closer to the reality or the truth? I think it itself becomes that itself becomes a topic of discussion in 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 development as well. Um, so that's that's um, I, I think that's kind of like a defining um, factor um, in in the in the up the the landscape of international development. That's kind of my brief response to the first question. The second question is, what would be the emerging issues in international development? Um, I have a very mundane uh, response to this, which is, in short, there's going to be a more of a nationalistic, uh, inward-looking uh, sentiments versus the people who are still trying to come up with ways for global coordination. Um, the need for global coordination is uh, stronger, but the conservative my country first type of mindset is also strong. Um, and it's, it's really hard to sort of overcome that um, nationalistic mindset in many uh, countries. Um, so the emerging issue here is to how to establish a conversation between national and, and global. And of course, to achieve global awareness is it's it's more disadvantageous and, and harder because, first of all, we can't travel that much, and and we have to re, we we are very receptive about what's happening in other countries, um, and, and it, this brings us back to the, my response to the first question of what exactly is the truth, um, so. Um, you know, it is in this in this regard that education for global minds becomes so critical. Uh, perhaps even in elementary or middle uh, middle school level, how do we understand other cultures, uh, other ge um, geographies beyond your own country? Um, how do we teach history, world history? You know, th this kind of awareness building becomes so critical to really overcome this nationalistic conservative mindset mindset, which is is a, is a bottleneck for um, further um, global collaboration. Um, that's my um, response to the second question. The third question, what are new approaches to international development? 
I really want to know. <laughs> I really want to know what that is. But I, I will tell you what I'm doing. And I don't know whether this is new uh, or not. Maybe this is kind of going back to the traditional way of studying uh, about development, which is, uh, uh, in short, localization of development ideas or development concepts. Uh, and this brings me back to the, the, the sort of the, the, the problematization of East and West dichotomy that, um, that Dr. Khan mentioned in the beginning of the session. Um, so in Japan, and, and I, I would say most part of, of Asia, we have this tradition of adopting Western ideas and translating in, it in, into our own context or interpreting into our own context and then apply it, uh, oftentimes uncritically. Uh, in, the, in the Japanese language, we have this, this writing form called katakana, which is just the, the imitation of sound of a foreign word. It's, it's not the real Japanese, but it's just the sound. And there are a lot of development ideas that, are, that we, we have to rely on katakana because we, we don't have a translation for that. For example, word like empowerment or advocacy or resilience, uh, you know, these words, we adopt it and we, we imitate it and, and without you know, critically thinking about what, what they mean in our own culture, in our own um, you know, tradition. Um, you know, like partnership or governance. Uh, these are the uh, typical words that, do, that we kind of uncritically import uh, uh, from mostly from the, from the West. Um, so this kind of mindset, uh, and, and I would say this tradition of adopting Western uh, thinking has been with us for a long, long time. Uh, I would say at least two, 200, uh, 300 years in, in, in Japan. Now this mindset shifted our attention away from more indigenous or Japanese term that we already have. Um, for example, in, in Japan, um, there's this uh, uh, concept called genbashugi, which is and, and, and there's no uh, good English translation, but it, it means on-site approaches. Uh, it, it means, you know, you have to be flexible, uh, flexibly adapting to the evolving situation on the ground. And, and this Gemba Shugi, the idea of Gemba Shugi is, a, is one of the key principle uh, uh, promoted by the Madame Ogata, who was the, the head of the JICA in Japan International Cooperation Agency for some time. Um, and this, but this idea is, is so Japanese and so context dependent, and there's no good English translation. It doesn't go beyond the, uh, the national <laughs> boundary of Japan. Uh, but, but, but because it's, it's, it's Japanese, the uh, Japanese people have not had the time, have not really sort of critically sort of put, you know, intellectual thinking to it, right? Um, so so on, the, on the one hand, we have this uncritical importation of Western idea. And then on the other hand, we have this uncritical use of the existing Japanese concept, right? So uh, we have to be critical to what the, the concept that we use and, 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 I, and I don't mean to introduce this new dichotomy of, of East and West. This, this, is, you know, um, this is not my intention. What I want to, to do is really to, to be clear about the cultural connotation of each concept and, and the boundary limits of each concept. Um, and so the awareness of conceptual boundary, I think, is uh, critical because whatever conversation we engage in, um, we need to rely on these words. And, and when, we, when it comes to practice, it happens in a particular location in, at, in, the, in a particular time. And context really matters, right? So for example, instead of asking how we can promote SDGs, everyone's saying that. Uh, but I would say we need, to men, uh, we need the mental power and the flexibility to ask what SDGs mean to the people in particular place in a particular time. Uh, which should include what it could mean differently in different place and in different time. And these are the imaginations that we need instead of, okay, how can we promote SDG goal 15? Or how can we, uh, you know, you know wh whatever goal that, that comes from, from the UN. Um, but, but unfortunately, this, this kind of instrumental thinking has been pre, um, quite dominant, uh, particularly in, in, in Japan. Uh, 
from my perspective. And finally, <clears throat> um, the fourth question given by the organizer was, what does it mean to talk about international development in the post-COVID-19 context? Again, um, I can spend 10 years on this question and then maybe write to a couple of books on it. Um, here again, I, I have this, this one small idea that, that, my, uh, that gives me my approach to understanding international development, which is really to criticize, uh, or to offer a critique of our preoccupation with the existing norm about development. For example, um, there has been a lot of emphasis on self-reliance. Being self-reliant is much better than being dependent, right? And you know, the, the Japanese foreign aid Ministry of Foreign Affairs has been given, given a lot of emphasis on um, self-reliance as the goal of foreign aid, right? So as the old saying, say, saying says, uh, you know, you should not give the fish to the fishermen, but you have to teach them how to fish, right? Instead of giving the fish. But my question is, okay, the fisherman has, knows how to fish now, what does he do, right? he will have to depend on the middleman or he will have to depend on the market to, to generate income. So it's just a question of one deep type of dependency shifting to another type of dependency, right? It's not uh, you know, foreign aid turning someone totally self-reliant um, in isolation from other types of dependency. So I would say the, que the real question is, uh, um, the phenomena or the intervention we call development, what kind of um, interdependencies that would it, it would shift or it would influence? And, and, and of course, I'm not saying that all interdependencies are good. Uh, some of them are maybe exploitative. Some of them are more uh, prone to um, sub subject to dominance and things like that. We should definitely avoid it. Um, but certainly there are good type of dependencies as well. And so to identify the nature of interdependency is um, the agenda for the, uh, for me, at least for me, the, um, uh, in the coming, um, 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 the, the, the theme of international uh, development. So that's all I have to say. And um, thank you so much for listening. And I welcome any feedback or comments from you. Thanks. Okay, Professor Sato, thank you so much. I mean, let me go back to both Mandy's and also um, to, to Hermes. If you have any imp immediate response to what some of the points that um, Professor Sato just mentioned just now, any any points at all? Good. Okay, Hermes, it's good. Mandy, any any points for the time being? No, I've just got a whole page of notes I made from it because I think yeah. so many interesting things that came up. But I was particularly, um, you know, you really struck a chord with me when you're talking about the the local contextualization of terms and understanding the boundaries of those, which is often just such an important issue that gets um, driven out in so many different de development agendas, whatever those are. So we we can talk about those later, though. I, I think one thing that we seem to see the consistencies right now between what, what Mandy was presenting and also what Professor Sato mentioned just now is in terms of the ideas about the, the, the truth and then the, the politics of truth and then the ideas of how the role of media can play in the trajectories of development here. And there seems to be a dynamics of powers and so on that, that's coming in and how the, um, the local knowledge and the local production of knowledge is not appreciated enough or even though it's appreciated, it's been very much uncritical of, of, of the applications of those knowledge itself. So Professor, Professor Sato, even, even may, I may ask one, one quick question. The role of context that you emphasize a lot right here, does it seem to be contradictory said, you know, like because of now, um, when, we, when we say that, you know, like the nationalistic mindset is something to be very much a problem, right? But then at the same time, we are talking here about the localizations of those knowledge and so on. Are oh, there seems to be a contradictory right there in terms of, the way we move forward through development ideas, focusing on yeah. the localizations right there. Can you respond yeah. to that quickly? Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, be, be, before I move on, please call me Jin. Okay. Yeah. Um, I would say I, you know, that that's the sort of the uh, um, the the conflict that you may feel on the surface, right? If you appreciate the fact that each place have local history, local context, then you would start to appreciate other places should have similar things. Right, so I'm we we're doing this this localization uh, of development concept in Japan, 
hoping that the similar movement will happen in Thailand or in Myanmar or in Cambodia. And then we can start to compare, okay, how are those development concepts emerged or adapted or invented in different places? So localization doesn't mean that you exclude others, uh, quite the opposite. You, you emphasize, you, you, you create this atmosphere uh, or appreciation of the culture of appreciation of where you come from, which should lead to the appreciation of other local cultures in my view. Yeah, but, but I agree that it's not the automatic connection. Hmm. And, and, and if, if you try to, um, there's one question that's raised from Tochi. I, may I keep that question for later on or, or, or um, and then I will come back to that, to that in a bit after Ernest mentions. And then so we can also start using the questions that Toshi raised here as, as a point for our further discussions among the three speakers after Hermes, if I may. All right, just one quick question to follow up right here. Um, one more thing, it's in terms of the conceptual boundaries that you are talking about. So when you talk about the conceptual boundaries, are we also talking about the cons, the code, the, the, or the creations of the new boundary also at the same times? Well, because of sometimes when we have like, you know, like um, try to, for example, with the field of international development or even the field of, interdisciplinaries and so on and so forth. And then, you know, like the, the, the boundaries between local and global knowledge and so on and so forth. But at the same time, we are, as much as we detach ourselves from that boundaries, make it blur, whatever, we are also creating a new boundary as well. How would you comment on that particular part right there? Sorry, can, can you, can you, I, I wasn't, I, I didn't quite get the, the main point. Oh, I mean, what, point. The, yeah. the, the point was that you were mentioning one thing about the conceptual boundary itself, yes, right? Yes, well, yes. Well, even though we are trying to, to differentiate between different concepts and so on and so forth. Yes, yes. While we are creating that, that conceptual boundaries, yeah. um, you think it's a good thing to have that boundaries or, or, or should we just let it blur, you know, like make it interdisciplinary, yeah. for example, yeah. international yeah. development. Yeah, yeah. Of course, all intellectual activities, all scholarly activities are related to cate creating categories, right? Uh, and, and boundaries. So that's, that's, you know, ultimately that's what we do, right? And, and, uh, and, and so the, the, the important thing is, is not, you know, whether, whether you can, it's not whether you can avoid it. I don't think you can avoid creating new categories. The, the bigger question is whether it's important enough of your time and effort. And I think in the field of development, there's been so much uncritical adoption of, of um, uh, concepts coming in from World Bank or other you know, famous scholars in the West um, without and, and downplaying, uh, downplaying the existing indigenous concepts that we already have or, um, and things like that. So it, it's just a matter of balance. And then I'm not trying to be exclusive or trying to sort of demonize uh, you know, things coming from the West, not at all. But we have to, we need some kind of a balance of uh, in, in the intellectual landscape, right? Of what type of, of, of concept we appreciate, what kind of, uh, of com concept we, we give authority and things like that. So it's just a question of balance. I think, I think that's quite an important point moving forward, you know, the kind of balance, how we're going to be able to strike the balance in terms of the meanings for international development itself. So now let, let's move on to, to Hermes now. So um, we already seen two perspectives from uh, distinguished scholars already. Now let, let's take a look at these particular issues of international development from the perspective of a practitioner. Okay, so we have with us today is Mr. Hermes Wong, who is a design thinking practitioner and a co-founder of Insight Path. So Ernest is a practitioner of design thinking and co-creations and open science, born and raised in San Francisco Bay Area and been living and working in Asia since 2012. Ernest holds a, a bachelor's degree in neurobiological, in, in new, neurobiology, physiologies and behaviors from the from University of California, Davis, and also an MA from the MATES programs here at Chulalongkorn University. So welcome home, Ernest. Uh, we're good to see you again. And then, so I will give the floor 20 minutes to you also to, to share your perspective about what you think about international development from the practitioner perspective, especially since you've been working here in Southeast Asia. How would you comment on that? Hermes, the floor is yours. Um, thank you so much, absolutely. And it is great to be <laughs> speaking with you as the moderator and, and having uh, and connecting back with maids. Um, it was such a pivotal moment in my in my life personally and professionally. So it's it's really great to be speaking here. Um, I will also expand the 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 role that I've been I've I've been um, 
defined with here too is that design thinking is absolutely the methodology that got me into working in international development, co-creation, um, and design, collaborative design work. Um, but I would say that these days I'm very much a facilitator and that is what my organization um, does is facilitation and we do that in many different ways and that connects to a lot of the topics that Mandy and Jin have both talked about today is creating common meaning and creating an, a diversity, a plurality of different um, words in people's awareness and how they can come together and create that space. I mean, we talked a little bit about um, about categories and divisions and um, earlier and and I agree it, it's not not every space can be for every person but it's about how we utilize those spaces to then look at the larger picture as well because there is such a diversity of experiences it's sometimes you just need to be in the same space as someone who understands what you're what you're going through and then be able to think about how that affects the larger picture um, I also the one I mentioned earlier that I resonated with Mandy talking about big D development, little D development. My my work, my research, and past the master's program at Maids was about open science, and we looked at big S science and little S science, and I particularly looked at that around how um, people can build open source laboratory equipment. <laughs> so I was utilizing design principles with my background as a scientist um, as well and looking at how people work together. What does it mean to do science, to conceptualize science, to conceptualize oneself as a scientist? Um, so that was a lot of really, really exciting work back then. I will keep my uh, answer short to these four questions from a practitioner's perspective. I'm gonna keep them short. They might sound a little bit like pretty like set, but I want to be sure to let everyone know that I hold them very lightly and I'm very excited to talk uh, in conversation about um, about the perspective that I'm putting on the table. Um, I want to get to the conversation so I won't keep these too long. So from my perspective, when we talk about international development landscape, one piece of context, I'm also going to be speaking from a place where we are practicing largely with development actors directly. Uh, at Inside Pact, we are in a supportive space. So we're looking at organizational development. We're looking at efficiencies within uh, organizations and with teams that are delivering, um, quote unquote, international development programs or humanitarian assistance. So we're, we're really looking at how people relate to each other within organizations to the bureaucracies of uh, our aid systems, as well as, of course, the people that they are seeking to serve and to co-create uh, futures with. So when I, from that perspective, when I look at international development landscape in a post-COVID-19 era, the, uh, just a few things come to mind, which is really that all the uncertainties that we had before the pandemic will be extremely amplified. And we're seeing that already with the Ukraine, the war in Ukraine and how um, so many <laughs> experts seem to have missed the, the calculation of what would happen. And so I can only believe that this is, that we'll have to question our certainties moving forward even more and to really dig into what we believe in and to hold, to not only have a strong position, but to hold them lightly because it is just going to be un, most more uncertain, but we can't begin that conversation if we don't have a place to start. If we don't, if people aren't able to say, this is a word that I use, this is a concept that I believe in, and this is um, a principle that I practice. There needs to be this element of both being strong and understanding and in, in what we want to do, but also to hold them lightly in conversation with others and allow those to change. It, that digs a little bit deeper into the work that we do specifically around facilitation. I mean, I think that the emerging issues in, in, in international development from my perspective um, isn't necessarily anything new. And I'm wondering if it's a if these emerging issues simply need a reframe of what we're already trying to do. There's so much talk about what we need to be doing in the future, but so much of it can be addressed right now in terms of just creating that common understanding. First, slowing down so that people can understand each other so that we can move more quickly together. It, the things that I wrote down here um, as a particular emerging issue though that I found is what is the emerging rhetoric, which connects back to what Mandy was saying and what Jin has been saying about the words that we use and how we uh, construct and 
and come to a common understanding with other people about the words that we use. I think one example coming from a perspective of being uh, someone who appreciates a rights-based approach and, and a democratic approach to things, when we're seeing state actors these days pushing for a redefinition of what democracy might mean for quote unquote true democracy, what does that do in a misinformation environment, an environment where people don't have the opportunity to uh, create common understanding that they are not just not being uncritical, but they're not allowed to be critical. Um, and what does that look like in in a space of for international development work? Um, I think that connected also back to some of the things that Jin was saying here. Another issue that is similar to the rhetorical example is just how do we reframe humanitarian issues so that they are understood in a way? We're still struggling to to have people understand climate change as something like in those terms or in a variety of other terms. We're still struggling to capture the media's attention and to understand how the technology behind the media uh, or the, what technology they're using to really push a rhetoric that will capture the imagination and the action of people um, to, to really take action and see how it negatively affects their everyday health and the well-being of the people around them. So when I look at private, uh, when I look at new approaches, again, this comes from my perspective as someone who came into international development studies as a student, as skeptic, um, because I went to study international development because I wanted to figure out, I needed to understand what was existing in the rhetoric and how people practiced it and try to change it. And so when I look at new approaches, I still see that there are opportunities in private sector engagement. Insight Pact is a social enterprise. It's framed as one. It wouldn't be considered one by many people, though, I will say, because we don't necessarily directly address, for example, a humanitarian target because we're in a support role to uh, in the international uh, development system. But one thing that I think is exciting about private sector engagement, and we're seeing this now too, the, the how in, in the Ukraine war, how the private sector is really uh, maybe I'll pause there on that because I don't have a fully formed thought on that right now, but it is just to say that from the very beginning when I was in uh, working in uh, the nonprofit sector, there was always the line of how nonprofits can learn from the business sector. And I do also believe now that 100% of the business sector can learn a lot from the social impact sector. But in terms of actual approaches, looking at how regulation, at how the private sector has utilized regulation and the advantages um, that civil society organizations, or I'm not being very eloquent about this. Let me take a moment. There are more structures than nonprofit structures that can cause real impact when delivering humanitarian aid, when delivering um, support programs, in trying to understand stakeholders who uh, need more voice in a system. Um, and that there's a, such a variety of regulation around organizational structures in Asia and the Pacific every single country has a different way to start a foundation. Every single country has a different definition of social enterprise. Every single country has, of course, their standard and different regulations around private limiteds, public companies, that if people working in the humanitarian sector and in the international development sector knew about, there would be a possibility to say, we can utilize this to our advantage in a way that um, doesn't limit them to a nonprofit. Uh, structure because there's nothing preventing people from running a private limited from a uh, from a nonprofit perspective either to not have to fall into a capitalist uh, share value raising rat race essentially they are from my perspective as someone who has started an, or a private limited and is 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 pushing for social impact um, that it is just a regulatory structure. And that a nonprofit regulatory structure and a for profit regulatory structure are not necessarily that different. They are just how you utilize and are governed by the jurisdiction that you're in. So there's some really interesting things here that I like that I will uh, 
go into that last question, what does it mean to talk about international development? I mean, I want to come back to education as well. When I think about how we there's a possibility to diversify the way that we bring into conversation all the different literacies the, that someone might need to engage in the social impact sector, whether it's in international development, humanitarian response, uh, environmental conservation, all of these things that somehow fall under international development. How do we how do we create different spaces that people can find what works for them and also still gives them the awareness of the bigger picture to to dive in? OK, maybe that went a little bit longer than I expected. Maybe some things weren't so clear as so I'm excited, please ask me questions in the chat. Tell me if I was not clear about something and that I can dive into more and I'm happy to put that into the conversation. Thank you so much, Hermes. I mean, there are several great points that you presented, particularly in terms of the role of the rhetorics and also at the same time, the role of private sectors. And then the, eventually the last part, which is the role of, of education itself. We're gonna come back to that. For the time being, Jin and Mandy, any urgent response or quick response to some of the comments by Hermes for the time being? before I start raising questions again. <laughs> Anything for now? Okay, then, um, yes, Mandy. Sorry, I was struggling to turn on my mic. I, I just had a, thank you so much. It, was, it really, really struck a chord with so many things. I just had a, bit, a particular question, um, and you might want to deal with it after as well, but about the importance of science and the, the big S science and the small S science and the, the need for open science, because I think this is one area that's often over, overlooked or not brought into the, these conversations enough, especially by those of us working in the humanities and social sciences. So I'd, I'd just be interested for your reflections a little bit more on that. Amazed, Absolutely. I mean, in many ways, the work that I was doing was using proxy as a science as a proxy for the word knowledge. And so that comes back to our co-creation of knowledge future of the global commons. I was looking at the hegemony of Western scientific method as something that we have allowed or allowed, maybe not the right word, that has taken over what is legitimate in terms of our knowledge generation. And this touches back to what both you and Jin have said about, about, um, about what are indigenous practices, what are other knowledges that are out there that just have been suppressed or have been pushed aside because of whether it's a localized, uncritical adoption of a certain set of terms or a larger concerted effort to um, to create a knowledge system that that prioritizes one form of knowledge generation. Um, what I was looking at with the work that I was doing in particular, it was a very grassroots uh, level of work, which was just simply bringing, in summary, it was really bringing together artists, uh, economists, scientists, engineers, and asking them to solve a problem and to create a tool. And so the question was also around when a scientist has to build their own microscope or water testing kit and look at the efficacy, what does that do to their understanding of what science is? When they do that with, together with an artist, how does that change the conception of an artist being able to create knowledge or to, or to redefine what knowledge is? Um, those are just some reflections. I'm not sure if I went in the direction that you wanted me to, Mandy, if there's something more that I can uh, ex expand upon, I'm happy to. Let me jump right into that a little bit because I mean, I'm curious about one thing that you also mentioned earlier on, Hermes, about the role of facilitations, particularly from your from the perspective of your company itself and also not the company, I mean, the social enterprise itself, right? And then how it's also related to the co-creations of knowledge. What do you see as a linkage between the co-creation of knowledge and the role of the, it's a social enterprise that you in terms of facilitations. Why is it so important that we international development have to emphasize on facilitation, as you mentioned before? Absolutely. And let's be honest, it is a company. By the law, Insight Pact is a company registered as a private limited in Thailand. And that is how we are regulated. Um, we have chosen like these labels. We are also act as a social enterprise. We also have cooperative principles in the way that we govern our organization that are not dictated by a, a government regulation. So it is an example of how, um, I, I would like to believe that Inside Pact is an example of how we can utilize one legal definition, but also in practice adopt many other things that allow us to express the company as something that is more than just a company, a private limited. 
Facilitation. I think it's a critical skill uh, for practitioners um, and anyone, really. It is the idea that you can hold space for people, synthesize in real time what you're hearing, and invite people into the conversation, and ultimately create common understanding, and from Insight Pack's perspective, transform that into collective action. Um, we always are driving towards action. Um, whether that action is small or large, if there's a way that everyone can get dirty with their hands, get into the, get moving, that is also a principle of design. It is about making something that people can use, whether it's a process, a service, or an object. So the idea around facilitation is really critical, I think, especially if we're, I mean, I come back to students. I think about the skills that students might need um, coming out of international development programs is I wish I had known more about the bureaucracies of the United Nations coming out of it and how to navigate that, just the, the reality of it, that the fact that there's 90% of people at the UN never get any sort of onboarding into the organization. How does one facilitate your own entry into the system? How do you know to ask the right questions, ask powerful questions of, um, and take up the space that you deserve as a employee or a team member in, in a bureaucracy. It's not just the United Nations, it's, it's any organization. Um, so whether that facilitation skill, I think is important from the point of view of being able to both create space, but hold, create space, hold space, and then allow people into that space as well. And coming back to the categories, knowing who should be in that space and knowing when to exclude people sometimes for the sake of the larger picture. So facilitation, though, comes in many different forms. I learned it from a design perspective. Over the years, I've also realized how wonderful and um, applicable, um, for example, methods from uh, peace and conflict resolution studies um, uh, can be. And that's great because it's so it's such something that's so they have so many different theoretical models as well as really, really applicable models. and. I mean, I would love to see more of that kind of work in international development studies programs in the future that, that bring in real practical examples, the theor theoretical models, as well as tools that allow students to engage in transforming conversations um, for whatever and they need to. I think that feedback is really important, particularly to me and also to Mandy as well, because of, you know, particularly here at Made Spirit program right now, we are restructuring the program itself. So these, these you know, like the, your, your suggestions in terms of the skill sets that students may be needed in the long run, it will be something to feed into our agendas also for the curriculum reviews that is upcoming. Um, I'm, I, I'm sure it's resonant to what Mandy will be needed for the program as well. Now let's go back to some of the questions because we've got a few questions from um, the, um, uh, the participants already. So to our participants who are both on Zoom and also those of you who are watching us on Facebook Live, if you have any specific questions that you want to throw in to our participants or engage in conversation, please feel free to do so. So we will catch it up and then we will start a, a round of discussions. So the first question is actually from Tochi um, at Shula IS. Um, the key question, the first question is in terms of the Western origins concepts. And most of the times how it's actually have an impact on the limitations of our imaginations. What would, what, for example, it would be something that helped uh, put us in boxes and so on and so forth. And the, it's, it's re also related to the ideas of, 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 um, of categorization and so on and so forth. What do you think about this, any of you, you know, a Western origins concepts, does it really limit our imaginations in terms of for us to really thinking about the future? Um, anyone can start if you have any comments on that. And then perhaps to relate to that um, first question right away with or not the Western origins concepts may limit our imaginations or not. It's also how, for example, the concepts that Jin suggested, you know, like that's been localized, to what extent is successful in terms of, you know, creating and becoming perhaps global concepts or even a regional concepts. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, let, let, me, let me start while um, Mandy and, and, and Hermes uh, have some time to think. Um, uh, I, I, I do. I do. I, I don't. I don't want to give emphasis on. On maybe it is true that Western concepts are really impoverishing um, indigenous ideas, but I think that 
rather than emphasizing that aspect, we should really emphasize whether we have made enough efforts to appreciate our own concepts uh, or appreciate our own history or appreciate what we already have. Now, the challenge for us is, is after this appreciation, what are the means to bring this up into the international agenda or, or the, the, the discursive politics that has been mostly dominated by um, the, the Western scholarship or like journals or publication channels, right? Obviously we have to write in English. This is, the, this is a key thing, right? If, if you, you know, as a Japanese and you discover something very interesting in Japanese terms, if you only write in Japanese, that will not affect the global discourse, uh, you know, primarily dominated by by um, by English. So, so we are kind of doomed to to um, to set agenda to, to to sort of engage in English. And this is kind of like a uh, it, it's a given, I think, uh, for for us. Uh, so, um, but but I think um, and and just uh, just reading the the chat, I, I do I do see that in certain cases um, foreign. Uh, concepts have been enriched by, you know, domestic or indigenous scholars, and that may have given uh, a, a productive feedback to the, um, the the original creators of those concepts. I agree, but still, this, if you look at the structure, it's reactive, right? And and what I say, what I'm saying is whether uh, these indigenous concepts can be more proactive in setting development agendas, right? Um, I, I wrote a piece called um, um, Asian Studies Inside Out, which was published in the, in the journal I edit. It's called the International Journal of Asian Studies by Cambridge University Press. If you're interested, please look at it. But what I'm saying is, is basically we need an inside out approach where you, you know what, if you discover something and you have a good idea, you cannot keep it inside, but you have to sort of proactively um, engage it in, in a bro to the broader audience. And in, in, in Asia, this tradition or mindset has been quite weak, I would say. We've been too busy absorbing and, and customizing uh, concepts that come from outside or outside in approach, I would say. Thank you. Many others, any additional comments on, on, on the same questions? Amis, do you mind if I step in or did you? You can, okay. yeah. Okay, thank you. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's such an important um, area of discussion for how we think of new ways of doing things, because, I, but I, I want to take it back to the issue of education as well, because um, actually, as Hermes, you, you've perfectly demonstrated that this kind of division between practitioners and academics, I, it, it doesn't really work very well, um, because, you know, I, I came from, I came as an academic from the perspective, not being a particular practitioner, but somebody who was working with um, various groups and on various um, locally initiated projects and then we couldn't access funding and so one way of doing this is to become an academic and then you have access to more different kinds of funding and you know most of the people that I work with in Myanmar I mean they know way more than I do I am the learner yeah and I always I am the learner and they they share more with me than I feel I've ever given back um, and but most of them also feel that because of the context of education there as well, they have to then go to do an MA somewhere and they have to build up the academic credentials so that they can learn how to deliver what they what they know they want to deliver, but in a way that they think is um, authentic and acceptable and um, is going to deliver things because it's framed by an academic context, which is primarily Western. So as soon as they then go into a context where they're learning, th there's often very little scope for them to bring forward what they already know and to have these discussions around the, the terminologies and, and language and so forth. It's like that's not present within the even the, the, the kind of basic educational structures that we give. So it depends at what point do people encounter the opportunity to be able to think about this and to say it's important. Um, so I think it's something that we have to we have to integrate into you know, how we approach this from within um, academic um, uh, training and in our programs and, and curricula and so on. Um, and I, sorry, I'll, I'll pass over to the others in a second, but I think we can also think through very specific examples as well. So um, where where I work in, in northern Myanmar, I mean, there, there's so, so many um, 
really important issues that are related to the, the national political settlement and the, um, the, 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 the huge traumas that local communities experience that have resulted in widespread um, drug misuse and all of the social problems that arise from that. But people come into it from a perspective driven by, often by a need to document human rights, for example, or to implement harm reduction. Um, and they, they seem to have a kind of moral cachet, which it, they do in, in very many respects. They're not bad things at all. But because they're, they're not, the, the, the intention is not to learn first from what the situation is and how people understand these issues, they end up not being collaborative in, in, how, how, in their outcomes. And they actually create a tension then when there shouldn't be one or doesn't have to be one. So I think in education, we, need, we really need to think about how we enable this conversation to be, to be embedded in what we do from the, from the ground up. 100%. I mean, I 100% resonate with everything that you both have been saying. This last piece here around the around how we listen ultimately and 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 make space to to learn from from others around us this is also i can say from a from a design practitioner's perspective i was quite fed up after a few years working on design methodologies with partners and clients because it felt like people weren't putting in the resources that they really needed to listen, which is that first phase of the design process, that first phase of co-creation is to, I think it's a bit of an outdated term now, but it used to be empathize. Um, I've moved beyond that personally, because I think that um, you can't really empathize with people without actually being them. And this is something that I have uh, come to, to believe more. You can strive to empathize with people and try to understand but being uncomfortable with not ever getting there is kind of the, the practice now that I see. And, and we don't have this space for people to be uncomfortable and to step into the discomfort of, of hearing things so, so vastly different from their own conceptualization of the space, their own assumptions moving into a space where they're trying to implement or do something good when really that first step just needs to be to really sit still and to slow down and to listen. And it comes back to the, the the rhetorical terms and understanding how people conceptualize their own lives. Um, with the, I think I'll stop there. It's really it's 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 all to say that it's very complicated. But I like the direction of our conversation. Yeah, I, mean, I think yeah. I think that, yeah. Jin, sorry. Go ahead. Is is that okay? Um, yeah, I, I have a quick comment on on on. Um, and I was struck by Hermes, you know, in your in your earlier talk about uncertainty, which I think is the key in understanding our our, our world and then perhaps shaping the future of education. Um, so, you know, I'm not supposed to say this, but uh, I, given that this is a um, uh, international uh, thing, I, I would say it. I was I was involved in grading the entrance exam of the University of Tokyo just a few days ago. This is a totally manual, unbelievably labor intensive work, right? In the age of computer, you know, you, you all, a lot of the very experienced professors who are like, you know, you know, very senior professors brought in and then manually grade. And, and you know, and then this is, this was world history, right? And then the, the, the kids, and then uh, the kids who get high scores are, are kids who memorize very well what's written in the textbook, right? And, and, and of course, this skill is very important, right? But only if the answer is there. Now, when you're out in the world, you have a lot of uncertainties. Now, would this kind of skill equip the students to face uncertainties? Probably no. And maybe this is not the job of the high school, maybe not. Maybe this is the job of the university, but the way we emphasize what knowledge counts more, it, I, it, to me, it doesn't really match what is needed in the world of uncertainties. Our education system is built on, on the assumption of certainties more than uncertainties. And that's the impression I got when I was involved in this grading practice or, or ritual at our university, which is known to be the top university in Japan and getting in and getting out from our university, you know, it's, it's a lot of privilege and they get into these important positions, policymakers, business 
businessmen, things like that. But I don't, but of course, then the question is, what the, what's the alternative? How do you measure people who have more capacity to face uncertainties? How do we, you know, grade them, right? Or how do we rank them? And if we cannot rank them, how do we choose which students to, to bring in, which students to exclude? So there's this big question. But anyway, it, it, this is something that we have to think about um, in, in reshaping education under uh, the world of, of uncertainties. I think that that's a really important point of our discussions right here, the role of uncertainties and perhaps disruptions that are happening and how we're going to be able to incorporate that to the design of even, you know, the curriculum or even the designs of the programs at the same time, how, how can we really strike a balance? Well, balance, of course, I mean, it's not always 50-50, right? Between the practice itself and, and, and then the academic knowledge that we have in development school, because of what we train sometimes, you know, it's exactly from the textbook, but when once you go out, the real world is full of uncertainties, it's full of disruptions that the knowledge or theoretical knowledge may not be relevant at all. How we would be able to safeguard our students early on when they carry on the international development work that they can do some things that, that, you know, that they can deliver the, the goal that they want to, to achieve. Now to relate to these questions of uncertainties, there's another question related to the principles of humanitarian aids and also development aids particularly with the ideas of neutralities and impartialities, because of, this is one of the ideas that's been thrown around in textbook when we talk about conflict resolutions and also in the delivering of development aids. In the case of Myanmar and Ukraine, for example, how should we rethink the ideas of neutralities and impartialities when it comes to the delivering of international aids, humanitarian aids, or even in terms of development aids? Do these principles still working? I think this is one of the questions, a key question from the floor and maybe relevant to the uncertainties that we are talking right now in terms of practice. Anyone want to jump on board with this question first? I can try and come in first, but mainly so that I can get my answer out of the way because I'm not really sure how to address it because it's so huge as well. Um, so, I mean, I, I feel that this is, this. Uh, addresses a level of knowledge and kind of experience and expertise at an international level, kind of international relations level, the international development approach, which is not what I do at all. So my, my questions are not informed properly by a lot of those agendas. Um, I think that, you know, my, my perception from having worked in Myanmar in conflict zones for 25 years, 27 years, a long time anyway, quite horrifyingly, um, is that these things have never really worked on the ground. And, um, you know, the, the issues of humanitarian, humanitarian aid in Myanmar, I mean, that, that's, that goes beyond the recent coup. Um, so I, I don't think that the, the, we, to perhaps they emerge in a context where there are supposed to be clear winners and losers and moral goods and 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 their opposites and that was the kind of framework the international framework in which those ideas emerged and, and actually that's that's always been a geopolitical issue and you see that in every context it's not only about Myanmar and Ukraine what about Syria what about Yemen you know there, there's, there's so many other conflicts going on um, so do these principles still work I think what my my answer is that I don't think they've ever really worked um, they've always been framed by politics and not development um, so I pass over with a request for help to um, to my fellow panelists. I think. So now, Jin or Hermes, any comments on that? I mean, do you agree with Mandy that it's never really worked on the ground? Um, I, I don't. I don't know. It's it's I, I, it's such a contextual thing, right? I I was I was in Thailand when I uh, when there was a tsunami in two thousand five, and I was involved in the. The Japanese emergency operation in in the in Phuket and Kaolak and all those those places, were, which was heavily damaged. Um, I, I wouldn't say it, it had no meaning. I I, I think it, it really um, you know it, of course it had some secondary effects, um, but uh, but I think they were you know I would say that humanitarian aid has meaning and it, and it's no I, I yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I was just going to say, I think because of my, I was trying to address it in the context of conflict, I think when you have other, other kind of um, okay. things caused by national dis uh, natural disasters and so okay, on, okay. But, but okay. there's still critiques. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
no, the, 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 the question that came to my mind after listening to this question is, okay, what is non-humanitarian aid, right? Because all aid should be, should, should be motivated by some kind of a humanitarian um, interest, right? Um, uh, if, it's, if, it's, if it's worth the name of foreign aid, because if it's not, then it's business, right? Isn't it? It's a, it's a pure economic exchange rather than foreign aid. So it would be interesting to think, you know, what exactly is uh, humanitarian aid and non-human humanitarian aid? That's the, that's the question. And and I, and and, and the, the big thing is because most aid are you you cannot operate, especially in the large scale, without the approval of the government. And that that is the cause of the the, the problem, right? So, and that that there you there comes in this question of impartiality. With if the government does not let you um, operate uh, be, because you know you're trying to assist the anti-government people, then you know that you're not you know you automatically have to you know force yourself into the the the, the side of the, of the government um so it's it's not the question of humanitarian aid per se but i think the institutional context or the the binding conditions set by the government which makes the humanitarian the 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 more of a pure pure type of humanitarian assistance more um difficult i'll stop here yes any comment it's just such a quick, tricky question i mean things that come up to mind are like, are we even doing a disservice to ourselves by calling these principles? Like, are these things that like, are these things that we can call principles? We've also somehow let ourselves get into the the state level of, of the scale. So I'll, I'll add to Jin by saying that it's not just about context, it's also about scale, because there was a question of morality in your answer as well. And I do, I came into this thinking like, my position is is largely, again, lightly held, so I'm open to the conversation, but that it's, it's, I agree with Mandy. I don't think that they've ever worked. I don't, and I don't think that at the state level, it's it's really something that can you. I don't think there is a neutrality or impartiality. I will say that right there. But when I thought about the scale, when I think about non-state humanitarian actors, when I think about families, when I think about people trying to to deliver the best that they can, and it comes back to our earlier conversations about how do we create space for civil society organizations that can't access state funding, bilateral aid funding, and how do we create space for more people to have the agency to do good in the communities? I, I don't have an answer, of course, for this, but it's it's also just uh, checking ourselves at the, at the scale at which we're having this discussion too, because I think that, that if we're gonna talk about a neighbor doing good for a neighbor and without, without necessarily having a, a what's in it for me immediately after, then, then there's a different story there than at the state level. All right, let me recap a little bit here. I mean, I think it's one of the, the, the three conclusions that, that emerged from this particular question is that, you know, what, have, what, what seems to be a textbook principles may not be something that works in realities. I mean, that's something that most of us agree here. And second of all, it's the context matters a lot in terms of thinking about international development or even the questions in terms of um, humanitarian aids and, and um, development aids right here because of whether or not it's in the term conflicts or are we thinking about it in terms of the disasters management and so on. And then the third question that I think is a great point also that um, Hermes brought in is also in terms of scale of it and also at the same time the role of agencies so how they're going to be able to play and so on here. Um, okay because we are running out of time right now so I for the last five minutes I would I would give you to the floor to but perhaps um, each one of you, one minute each, one or two, you can have a few more okay, um, reflections on what you think about um, international development in general. So any final comments, final remarks that you may, may make? I mean, even to, to, to think about the future of it, right? How would we define the term future of development um, potentially? I know it's meanings uh, that maybe some of you tackle already, but then if you have some final remarks on, on these particular issues, um, I think I will go re in reversal in reverse order, starting from Hermes first, and then go back to Mandy. I'll keep it very simple. I'll come back to this facilitation element. I think that there is a role for every person to be a facilitator in in their own lives in the international development sector to ask powerful questions, to learn the skills to hold space for others for themselves in that space, and to create common understanding and to. Uh, catalyze collective action as a facilitator. And I think that everyone has that 
capability if they think that they can and and uh, to find the resources to to be able to do that. And I think that with listening and with with creating common understanding and pushing people to action, the, there will be more agency in, in the communities that we want to serve. All right, Jin? Yeah, um, so I want to conclude my talk, uh, the, the, um, my, my time with, uh, with a question of, of um, I think we should search for a better term than, uh, than development. Um, it's, it's, it's an invention of, of you know, 20th century um, you know, mindset, uh, you know, where, where this with, with, a, with a linear progressive connotation um, which does not quite fit in the very uncertain world today. Um, I don't say that, I'm not going to say that, you know, development totally lost its significance. We can deal with it, but I think we should, we, we need a better term. Now we have sustainability, but, but, but the question is, of course, sustainability of what? Um, and so I, I think, you know, maybe we, maybe Khan, you can organize another conference on what, what, What's what's after development? Okay, then then we we can talk about it. Great, thank you so much. I really enjoyed. Thank you so much, Jen. Now I will go to Mandy. Yeah, just picking up on what Jen and Hermes have said, I think that um, yeah, I, I agree totally that develop the term development isn't helpful because there's just no clarity about what you're talking about anymore, or who or the or the scale or the location or the relationship. So, it, it, I don't find it helpful. Um, so picking on that, I think, where, where do we go next, which is what you asked, Jen. Um, I mean, there's, there's been an attempt to use the term just transition, um, you know, to focus on ideas of energy transition. And this is the big driving factor in the move towards carbon zero as the main way of dealing with the climate crisis. And the climate crisis is actually the thing that what we understood as development is going to be remodeled through. Um, so that I think that the term just transition, though, is also problematic um, and it's being critiqued mainly in the global north, um, you know, about labor rights and so on. And, you know, how, how workers who are involved in these old industries, how they how they can be supported. But it's something that can be um, thought about and, you know, it, it is probably is more helpful in the present moment for focusing on, on this as the big global global problem. So I think more in. It, at the moment, we have a sense of the globally interconnected difficulties and challenges that we all face in a way that we haven't had in the same way ever, probably. Um, but then it become the, the, the key terms that come out for me from our conversation is discomfort and the um, the, the 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 difficulty of this as well. And, and also, Hermes, I really loved your insistence on um, slowing down as well and slow thinking and light thinking as a way of learning and understanding about and as Jin said you know the different contexts and the way these things are interpreted so we're in a we're in a moment where previously when we had a sense of the global interconnectedness of problems there was a, a, a an ideological move to say okay we have therefore the solution we can frame them with if we do this we will create the change that we need but I think we don't have that now you know, everything is very fragmented. So you need this intense localization as well as to make sure that how we globally deal with collective problems are implemented and understood and have meaning in a setting where the people who are engaged with, with that problem locally have to have to um, take the, be responsible and also be accountable for the outcomes as well. And addressing the inequalities in that is, is a challenge. Great. Thank you so much. I mean, I will definitely try to organize something once again, so, you know, not only just for this particular international conference, but I see that, you know, like we don't have enough time today. It's one hour and, and 30 minutes. I thought we're not going to be able to fund through all the times, but, you know, like we have more, a lot more to, to tackle on. Particularly, I, I really like the ideas about the transitions and, you know, the, the wording that, that, that Mandy frames at the very end and all these key terms that we can potentially elaborate on. And as Jin mentioned, you know, like perhaps we can organize some other events, you know, in relation to this thinking and whole thinking about the, the international developments again, if the term development is no longer a suitable term for understand the global dynamics, then what is the alternative? What would be that transition that will bring us to a, something different? 
as uh, as as we're going to be seeing. So for those of you online and for those of you in Zooms here, I would like to thank you so much for for joining us today in in this particular panel. And there will be a closing plenary for this international conference following this. So thank you you all so much, and thank you all the three all of the three panelists for today. Uh, a big round of applause to all of you. I have to keep here. All right. Thank, thank you so much once again, and thank you for thank becoming you. part of this international conference. Thank you very much.